Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 4, Episode 18, titled Badge of Dishonor. We have a few of those throughout the run of this show. There's a few badges of dishonors. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually been quite a while since we've had the Crooked Cop Yes, story. it has. Yeah, we, we, we're a while in here. It originally premiered on March 18th, 1988. Now, this is where it's going to get really interesting, and I'm intrigued to see what you guys think. It is written by Dick Wolf with teleplays by Michael Duggan and Peter Lance. All three of those are either producers, showrunners, or story, or the head story editor. Like They are the cream of the crop when it comes to Vice. They are, they are at the top of the food chain, I, I should say. Well, I mean, should I mean this should be like the best Vice episode of the season then? It should have. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, because the director is Richard Compton, who also directed Down for the Count Part 1 and 2, Everybody's in Showbiz, The Big Thaw, but he's also got three (laughs) more episodes coming. (laughs) It's just really interesting to me that there were such heavyweights for Vice in the writer's room and in directing that were involved in this episode. Was it A, because they had an outline and like, would they pick that one out? Like Dick Wolf picked that up. It's like, I, I want to work on that one. Or is it B, Dick Wolf wrote yeah. it. And so then all the bosses were like, well, we got to do this one. Because Dick Wolf wrote it. Yeah. yeah. I have a different theory because something you'll notice when we get the guest stars is there's a certain amount of recycling in this episode <laughs> as far yeah. as who they used. And so I think this was more... We need another episode to fit into the season, you know, for this week. And so we don't have a big guest star. We don't have like big thing, a big song and music, really. We need a really good story to try and make this (laughs) thing work. (laughs) Like all hands on deck. We have nothing else going for us. (laughs) Well, this is also the last episode that premieres on Friday nights, like Friday at nine. So I think at this point, because we're almost to the end of season four, like ratings have really taken a dive. Yeah, and then they get drastic. And, they're trying mm-hmm, like, okay, let's change the time. Yeah. Before we get started, I could check in see who's going to each other's lives. Guys, there is a festival happening down in Austin called the ATX Television Festival. And down at the mm-hmm. ATX Television Festival, Melissa's favorite TV shows were all getting together at one time. Including two guys from One Tree Hill making their, that's where they're at. Oh. They're doing, <laughs> that's where they were pitching their show. <laughs> oh, Two Tree Hill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this one's going to have less crying over horses and more trampoline basketball. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> who doesn't want more trampoline basketball? <laughs> I don't see where the problem was in that. <laughs> also, a little <laughs> show called Felicity was there. I know. I saw that. I saw. And it, including one of the main actors who didn't remember what the ending was. Yeah, well, that's why Felicity didn't end up with him. So, <laughs> just saying, Scott Foley. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll be honest. I don't blame him. I don't, rem- I don't even remember what that show is about. <laughs> <laughs> but you remember what Dawson Creek's about. It's exactly the same. It was on the, like, they were back to back at one point. Like oh, they were one literally... of them was good. One of them wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it's not Dawson's Creek. So <laughs> you are correct. It's a one hard thing to good. live up to. I mean, a lot of shows weren't as good as Dawson Creek. Well, not you know just that, Felicity. Just, just for the record, you on One Tree Hill, they used to make fun of Dawson's Creek. <laughs> They'd be like, "Oh, you mean that's because those... they were a total rip off." Uh, hey, no, they I've were got not. an idea for a show. Teenagers, it's a total rip off. I stand by it. <laughs> I just like that One Tree Hill was making fun of Dawson's Creek. That's what I'm saying. In between <laughs> yeah. playing trampoline yes, basketball. Yes, that's what I'm saying. That's how bad it is. <laughs> and Nick Lachey appearances. Yes. That's how <laughs> – and a dog once ate a heart that was supposed to go to a transplant. <laughs> but they were making fun of Dawson's Creek. There's They're a all, single saying, character on that show that can hold a candle to Pacey. So. <laughs> now, I do love Joshua Jackson. So I, got it. I do agree with that. <laughs> well, the other show that was having a get-together – call out the writer of articles about this meetup because they're saying amongst a sparsely filled room ouch journalists ouch okay <laughs> because the meeting was for the tv show 30 something which was actually pretty groundbreaking and pretty mm-hmm. much the forerunner for every modern family drama Especially on television marriage like marriage and family like for 30 something people that was a thing they didn't have shows like mm-hmm. that. It wasn't like it wasn't the like a dynasty is, or you know like a, a soap opera. It was real stuff that was going on in real people's lives. The problem is, is that their audience isn't thirty something anymore. They're more like sixty something, <laughs> and they're busy, <laughs> or they don't know where this festival is. 
<laughs> or that what it's too far to drive. <laughs> exactly. Parking was too expensive. <laughs> yeah. Then it was after five thirty. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> It just seems like, Melissa, maybe we should plan on going to the ATX TV Festival next year because it seems to be the Melissa television experience. That, I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> why do why do none of the people that I want to see from those shows go to Comic-Con? Come on. Come to Comic-Con. I don't know. I think we passed. I would feet. go to that festival. I would go to that <laughs> festival as soon as Jill Hennessy and the rest of Crossing Jordan are there. <laughs> um <laughs> You could probably go to like a Comic Con and see her for like five bucks. She's probably there. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to pay. To, like, she's getting a new show, by the way. Oh, Jill okay. Hennessy's getting a new show. Is it on so, Yeah, she's still in better. <laughs> so in your eye. <laughs> Actually, no. I, 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 I want to say it's like NBC better. or she something. She was bad before. <laughs> she's doing, she's better, doing better. She's had a pretty good career. She was in order for a little bit. Yeah, I remember her. Melissa, I think they pass on Comic Cons, especially the Phoenix Comic Con, which was just a couple of weeks ago, because it's on the surface of the sun. Who knows why Phoenix Comic Con <laughs> decides to do it in May? I don't know why. I just, I think that's why Drax didn't want to come. He's like, that's too hot. <laughs> <laughs> he was supposed to come and he backed out at the end. Yeah. Dave Bautista's like, like I'm there? out of here. No. <laughs> yeah. How hot? How far is it from the airport? No, no. <laughs> Speaking of things that we've missed, we missed Tubbs. Tubbs doesn't get a whole lot of stuff to do in season four. And this is a pretty Tubbs heavy episode. Very happy to see Tubbs the man in his I love, really I love expensive suit. Tubbs the man in his expensive suit and his beard. Yes. Making Crockett look like a waiter or something. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk about this week's episode. When we open up, we're in Hobo Town or Hoboville. <laughs> Hoboville is what I'm going to call it for the Give rest of the episode. Give it some class, okay? We're sticking it up. <laughs> so help, help me settle. Is, is that homeless Michael McDonald or homeless <laughs> Kenny Loggins? <laughs> At the beginning there. I go with Kenny Loggins. <laughs> this is a side of Miami we've never seen before either. We've never seen like the homelessness, the street homelessness. And I was very confused about this setup because we have all these lots of homeless people that are all in like a general area. We've seen them like in small oh, I was, like, sections. I'm like confused. Yeah. I'm like, what about all the times they go to the beach and they're there at that one <laughs> spot by the bathroom? Yeah, it's like, like <laughs> yeah. a few seconds. Yeah. Like this is a theme throughout the whole episode. And then also there's all these abandoned boats that are that have been marooned on land but then there's a regular dock and like nice boats all parked along the dock i don't know the river part of miami is not a nice portion no that's the, let's go there <laughs> am i the only one that's excited that we're starting off with surveillance you know because we're so good at that you know it's gonna go good <laughs> I, I was counting until the sting went bad just like counting backwards like five <laughs> four three hey but this wasn't their fault <laughs> Tubbs is there to do the final meet, like they're going to bust the dealer. He's there with the money. He's going to go buy a lot of cocaine from this man on his boat. He's got a great skullet, too, by the way. That huh? was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> He's wearing a wire. The whole vice team plus the Miami-Dade Police Department are there ready to make the bust. It's just waiting for the deal to happen, and then they're going to move in. Tubbs goes in. He does great. They, he tests the cocaine. Everything looks great. It looks like it's about... The bus is about to happen, and then some police officers who are in a separate boat from everyone else, they make a call to then fire on and make the bust. And that's what we think is what's going to happen here. They open fire on all the dealers and Tubbs. Tubbs jumps into the water and swims away to escape, barely, by the way. He's very mm -hmm. exhausted by the time he makes <laughs> it back to land. And in defense yeah. of him, it's really hard to swim in a full suit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The cops just pop up. They yell police and just start shooting. So, like, uh, uh, like they were almost aiming for him. And then they go running over these police. Obviously, the rest of the real police now hear the shooting, come racing over. They don't get there in time because these, as we find out now, that they're fake police. They kill three people. They steal the drugs. And then they handcuff the main drug dealer and push him into the water that's just brutal and then they hop in a boat and drive away and the vice team as sunny comes running up he sees Tubbs, make sure he's okay they go running up to the boat but everyone's gone and there's three people dead and we go to the opening credits this episode the way things kind of lay out can be a little confusing so watching this first scene in the episode my immediate thought was why is their backup robbing them? And then 
my next thought was basically they are robbing a heist. Uh, I mean, uh, the, I mean they're robbing a sting, which is already pretty bold because you're robbing cops as they're about to arrest the drug dealer. But it's like, how did they even get the information that it was going down? It's just kind of crazy that the now criminals have figured out how to rob the vice squad just like that easy, like <laughs> during heists. <laughs> Yeah, they're in the middle of a bust, and they're they're able to still get in. Not like the bust hasn't happened yet, or they're waiting for them, like to set up a fake bust. Like, no, they have it down to a science. 94 seconds, in and out, we can clean the vice team <laughs> out before they even get here. <laughs> yeah. They put on their dead president masks, <laughs> and they're able to get in and out before anyone even notices. Yeah, and it was, like, timed up perfect, because as soon as Tubbs finished testing the cocaine, it was like, he gave the call signal. They come popping up, rob them, before the vice squad can even move in. And Why are they parked so far away? <laughs> because they're supposed to be hidden. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so were the robbers, but they only hit two boats over, and it seemed to work for them. <laughs> the one thing I did miss is that Tub sees a homeless woman that's there watching the entire thing. And his cop intuition should have said, we need to go talk to this woman Why right now. Why did he go talk to her? I wondered that. Like, she's a witness. Go talk to her. I might have an answer, and it's going to come up right now in guest stars. Suspicious homeless woman who we find out in one of the very next scenes is Detective Montana Stone. He's played by Michelle Shea, who also played Dr. Cheney. And so Tubbs is looking across. He's like, I recognize her. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my God, that's Dr. Cheney from the episode Teresa. And she's just apparently she just fell on hard times. <laughs> So, a brief recap of Michelle Shea's career. She was also in Michael Mann's Manhunter. He got game. And she won a Tony for Best Actress in, in her 1996 play, Seven Guitars. Our next guest star is Jesu Garcia, a.k.a. Nick Corey. Uh, he plays Cologne, but he also played Officer Ramirez in the episode The Good Caller. Continuing our theme of dirty cops, that drug dealer that gets robbed is, you know, formerly Officer Ramirez. Formerly because he blew up. <laughs> <laughs> he died in a fire explosion in the last one. Or did he? <laughs> yeah, apparently he didn't, but... <laughs> Chisu Garcia was also in Nightmare on Elm Street, Predator 2. He was most recently in 2011's Atlas Shrugged, Part 1. He also runs pro a production company called Scott J.R. Productions, along with author... John Rogers, who I guess wrote the novel Spiritual Warriors. You know, one of my things that I can't stop doing now is that anything that's a part two, like Predator 2, everything in my head is a Predator 2, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Infinity War Part 2, Electric, Electric Boogaloo. Boogaloo. <laughs> Boogaloo. <laughs> like, <laughs> on Twitter, terms of endearment <laughs> to, to Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> By the way, I love George Wallace. Okay, so our last guest star is Rennie Santoni. This is actually his first appearance in Vice. He plays Lieutenant Arturo Dominguez. He's probably our biggest guest star. He was in Dirty Harry, Brewster's Millions. Uh, he did voices in both Dr. Doolittle movies. Uh, he was also in 28 Days. He was also in Cobra. Mm, uh, he's the boss in Cobra. I forgot so, about he's that. his boss. What's funny is he plays, I want to say Dirty Harry, he's Captain Gonzalez. And in Cobra, he's just Gonzalez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Up no, the he captain might be his just... partner or something, or no. Yeah, I can't remember, but he's definitely in it, yeah. Uh, he also made appearances in the Rockford Files, Moonlighting. Hmm. Hmm. Murder One. He also uh he was in five episodes of that. And he also appeared as Poppy, the unhygienic restaurant tour <laughs> in Seinfeld. <laughs> My comment when I saw him was, don't let him come sit on your couch. <laughs> Remember, he's the one that pees on Jerry's couch and he can't get it out of his couch. He has to give it away. <laughs> So I figured you guys would know that. So yes, that is our, our lieutenant in this one. I do have some honorable mentions. Julio Oscar Machisa Machoso, who you guys might remember all the way back in season one as Lester the Tech Guy. Mm, yes. That was him. 
He makes the appearance in the episode. He also played Tommy in Lend Me an Ear. And then, as an uncredited pedestrian, we get Barbara Streisand. I'm not going to talk, because I'm assuming most people know who Barbara Streisand is. Who? Huge oh, wait, wait. musician, actor. She's um, married to James Brolin. That's the only reason why I know her. <laughs> okay. Sure. <laughs> I wasn't even going to mention it. I watched the episode and I didn't see her. So like she didn't have a, she didn't say a word or anything. They didn't even give her a credit part. So I wasn't even going to mention her, but apparently Dom, you saw her. Yes. I'm pretty sure it's her in the scene where they come pulling up in front of Dominguez's yacht. There's for whatever reason, there's a woman in a black dress and high heels walking all alone. There's no one in every direction. Except for this one woman that happens to walk right in front of Tubbs and Crockett. And then Crockett looks at her as she walks on. But that's because... They dated. They were dating at the time he was doing that show. For I don't know if exactly at that time. So, but I know while he was he was on there, he, they dated for like two years or something. Th- does that mean he's not married anymore? Since he, you know, broke up with <laughs> yeah, his Caitlin. wife. She's still there. Uh, Caitlin who? <laughs> they talked about her last episode. <laughs> Tubbs mentioned her. <laughs> that counts, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that's her. Also, I, on a side note, apparently if you date Don Johnson, you will, you will get into some of his movies or TV uh, shows. You will. Yeah, that's it. I mean, Melanie Griffith. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct team meeting. No one knows who those people were. They had identified themselves as comps. And that's all that they know. It's because Tubbs obviously heard them because they jumped up and said police and they just opened fire. They're pretty sure there's been three times that there's been something similar to this has happened. But all they know is that at the riverfront or the river is what they call it. There's a special ops team because crime has been so bad on that side of town. There's a special ops team. And so that's the only lead that they have that crime is really bad. And they have some special team. The lieutenant. Wait, 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 wait. Special ops team. How come yeah. the special ops team doesn't handle, you know, random homicides that homicide doesn't <laughs> want or these special projects of protecting people? Like, isn't that what special operations is? Only by the river, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, why yeah, aren't yeah. we watching Miami special operations? I'm saying, like, why aren't we watching that show? <laughs> Because I think they live and die all in this episode. Yeah, that's it. They're gone. (laughs) Yes, I am going to bring that up, though. We have a surprising amount of dead cops at the end of this episode. (laughs) Well, the lieutenant of the team, that special ops team, Lieutenant Dominguez, comes in and he says, stop your investigation. It can't be cops. We had a break in at a warehouse and they stole a bunch of police gear. And why would police officers need to steal police gear in order to do a a heist like this and Tubbs says hey it could be your side it could be our side no 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 no. Tubbs says there's a leak coming from you yeah that's right Tubbs says there's a leak coming from you and then Dominguez says like well it could be our side it could be your side and Castillo (laughs) does not like that one Dad's like nope it isn't from us (laughs) (laughs) I'm just stating a fact it's not coming from here that's what we're saying okay (laughs) Dominguez doesn't like that it's being insinuated that the leak is coming from him and that also he's too stupid to understand that it's coming from him and so then he goes out in a huff. Tubbs says that also this wasn't a turf war because that everyone was wearing a ton of jewelry. There was a lot of other things that could have been stolen, but there they wasn't. They just took the drugs and they ran off. Dad wants the ladies to investigate the background of the spec offs team. Tubbs and Crockett are going down to the warehouse where the stuff was stolen. Meanwhile, there's a man that looks very much like the Latin Eminem. He's <laughs> driving and he's on the phone talking to someone in Spanish saying he's going to go get two kilos. The man wants him to go get two kilos. He's going to take care of it. But he gets pulled over. Very official looking police undercover car, but two men that get out or three men that get out that definitely aren't cops. The man immediately recognized the quote unquote police and starts telling him like, I've already paid you. I paid you four times. I don't understand why you guys are harassing me. They just walk over, open up his door, pop open the trunk, take the drugs out of the trunk and then go to leave. And the man are Eminem's like, I'm going to kill you. You know who you're messing with. And then they stop turn looking. He's like, no, I'm just playing guys. Like, <laughs> <laughs> So then Brian Bosworth, I mean, the muscle bound arm guy from the police 
comes over and shoots him, and then he falls back into the water. One note on that scene with them pulling the guy out of the car and stuff, that's just how bold they've gotten. Now they're just driving around Miami, just pulling over random drug dealers and robbing and murdering them. (laughs) At this warehouse, the duo are talking to the main officers in charge, and we know in Miami there's a problem with these centralized warehouses that hold weapons and or evidence. It seems like a bad idea. They should kind of move it around and keep it in various different places instead of one central repository because they seem to get broken into or, or blown burned, up. burned down, yeah. <laughs> the lead officer at the warehouse says, we have a high-tech security system, but for this break-in, they happen to be able to bypass it. But we also don't think it was police officers that did this. He didn't say that. He just said, like, they took this. And then M-16s. they... Maybe yeah, they and wouldn't... <laughs> Yeah. Maybe they wouldn't get robbed so off now. They just did a better job at policing this type of stuff. You know, <laughs> warehouses with guns and evidence. Yeah, like actually having people there you all know. the time. <laughs> Maybe not have windows. That's what I'm saying. You know, yeah, that too. Yeah. Suggestions. <laughs> Over at the precinct, the lady had found the information on the spec ops. There's 12 people total. Nine of them are Cubans. That's kind of weird. <laughs> <Just saying. laughs> Dad says pull the check. And all nine see- of the Cubans were hired as recent as ni- as eighty five. Yeah, there it's a very and young- apparently they would make one hell of a baseball team. So <laughs> yeah, that's why tech for the racist comment. <laughs> Dad says, go pull the jackets. I want to find out more information about who these people actually are. And then Stan gets a call and says that they found that dealer that Brian Bosworth killed. <laughs> He was a river dealer, too. And then Dad says, okay, well, then call Tubbs and Crockett and have them go go investigate. Down by the river, the duo show up. The murder's being investigated. And Tubbs sees the same homeless lady. And now is like, oh, maybe I should go talk to her. And he starts to give chase as she runs away. And it's this extended... Dr. Cheney's pretty chain. fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get this extended hide-and-seek scene with tubs in montana how can she hide in that thing she's wearing she's like like she's a gypsy or something <laughs> all the like scarves wrapped around her and the, you can't hide in that benny hill music's playing as they're dodging in and out of yeah, exactly. she tries to hide but eventually tubs stumbles on her and she pulls a gun he says he's a cop and she says okay prove it he shows the badge and she pulls out her badge says i'm with the special ops team Question, was she pulling the gun on Tubbs and asking him to prove that he was a cop because she was nervous that it was other spec ops or because she was worried that she would get caught? Like, why run away from a police officer if she's a police officer? Because it's all that stuff is going to look bad, right? Like, why didn't she re- Why didn't she write a report if she's a cop? Why didn't she write a report when she saw the night? He saw her. She saw him. So she knows that he saw, you know what I mean, that they made eye contact. So I think she was trying to play it she off. She did write a report. But they don't have it. So that he doesn't know that. That's what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that she's trying to hide what by play, trying to play it off like she doesn't know he's a cop. Or maybe she didn't know he was a cop. I don't know that they if they knew Tubbs was a cop. I don't know that part. Like if they knew that that, that, that was going down or if they just got tipped off that there was a drug deal and they were just going to break it up. Yeah, that I could see. I don't know. That she's not sure if he's a cop because she only sees him for the deal. Yeah. And then... But she has the jacket I know, I don't case know. and intelligence file. That's why they knew to oh, rob true. that because they knew that there was a vice thing that was going to happen. But then why didn't they know yeah, Tubbs was the cop then? The other two guys. When they, that's what bothered me throughout most of this episode was like, how do they not know Tubbs is a cop? It was his his case, his thing that they robbed at the very beginning. So, I mean, it, and then he, sh- he shows up to the investigation of the dead guy on the side of the road. And, like, also, you guys all work for Miami-Dade Police Department and have probably bumped into each other more than a few times. Also, in the beginning, when they're dressed as cops, were they there because they knew there was a sting happening? Or were they just following that drug dealer waiting for a deal to That's happen? what I think they were doing. I thought they were... I didn't think they knew that it was a, a, a police but- deal. I thought they knew that. Then it was why a drug did they need do- then why did they need Detective Stone to get the files of the surveillance then? That's true. I don't know. Yeah, and then because they didn't try to actually arrest anyone, they said police, but they just killed them all. Yeah, so were they gonna kill cops? Yeah. That doesn't seem no. Yeah, I don't know what the hell's going on now. Now that I've had a deeper <laughs> Wait a minute. On it. See? <laughs> See? I told you. If you're watching it, there are times when this episode doesn't make any sense because it's like, well, wait a minute. Like, shouldn't they already know Tubbs is a cop? Like, shouldn't that have been part of their research? We just had that whole argument right here. We all came away with pretty much, I don't know. It doesn't make <laughs> sense. 
I, I don't know. So let's continue to work it out and see if something else comes <laughs> Table up. That <laughs> okay. Th this scene basically ends. We find out she did file a report, but the report went missing. Also find out that she got the short end of the stick as far as assignments are concerned. <laughs> because, you know, Tubbs gets to dress up in fancy suits and drive around in nice cars. And she's undercover as a homeless person like seven days a week. Like She gets to hang out with homeless people. She even says that she got her clothes out of the trash can. I was like, I don't think you need to be that undercover. Well, they, you yeah. can tell they were from the trash. But. <laughs> At the precinct, Stan has some info on the spec ops. The names that they have, he's confused. Like, these can't be cops. He shows it to Gina and Trudy. And they're like, no, we triple checked them. This is for sure the right names. They take it to dad and they say, look, these guys have a rap sheet a mile long. When they were juveniles, they all had criminal records when they were juveniles. And dad's answer is that they were diversity hires. What we have here is a time where at, it was ripped from, from the headlines because there was the McDuffie riots that happened yep. in Miami, which was like a Rodney King type mm -hmm. scenario. It was a racial motivated. Yeah, where a Hispanic person, it where it happened to a Hispanic person in Miami. So there was these big riots for two days the city was on fire and one of the things that came out of it was probably yeah. this this is what castillo was hinting at that they were going to have more diversity hires yep and that's what you think. following the riots <laughs> i didn't know anything about the mcduffie riots at all but be before this episode yeah so so the answer to the mcduffie riots was to hire the first nine cubans that applied <laughs> sunny finds the paperwork and says that they were arrested back in the day by Dominguez. So there's now this paper trail that looks like we have dirty cops that have a criminal record and that were arrested by their by their commanding officer. And so maybe they're all in cahoots. So now the duo are going to go talk to Dominguez. We have kind of a back and forth where we see that team that, of the dirty cops. They're like self-congratulating each other at this flop house where they're high-fiving and exchanging cash. and. <laughs> And, Showing uh, each other their muscles. And... <laughs> the duo show up, and Dominguez happens to live on a gigantic yacht. It's you. Yeah, dude, how does he afford that place? That, <laughs> that is the biggest damn yacht. That's exactly what Tubbs is wondering, too. And so they stake out there at the yacht for the, until Dominguez comes back. And that's what Tubbs asks him. Like, how can you afford such a big place? He mentions earlier that police work must be a hobby of his. He's making money some other way. And Dominguez, who's pissed that they're there, says, look, I was on the same trail as you guys. So I don't have any evidence. And Sonny's like, yeah, right. That's got a hole in it. The size of the Grand Canyon is what he says. And then when Tubbs asks him, well, how do you afford this place? He says, well, I married well. Yeah, but they don't uh, really have any evidence that he knows anything other than he hired them. They don't have any evidence. Yeah, but that excuse shut Crockett up pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, I did the same thing. And then his wife with the most, the biggest shoulder pad you will ever see in your life. She had football stuffed in the side of her dress. <laughs> comes out and, and hurries him. The duo don't believe him, but they agree that they will meet with him tomorrow because his wife is ready to go. On. She needs to go. Okay. Yeah. She's got caviar to eat or something. <laughs> we see really fast that at that night, someone's breaking into like the Dominguez office or somewhere in it's, that it's department. Like, yeah. Central filing or something. They have a key for, for the filing cabinet. Breaking, too. It. Breaking in might be put a little strong. Uh, those filing cabinets, you know, the locking ones tend to work better when you don't leave a key in the lock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, the spec ops team is off gambling like our dirty cops. They're gambling and drinking and doing coke. And then there's a knock at the door and boom, it's Montana. She comes in and takes her share of the money. Because she's dirty. Dun, dun, dun. Dr. Cheney's about to get back on the horse. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, Dominguez's office to do a show up and in the office, they're kind of looking around like, this is kind of weird. Some vice cops just showed up, but Brian Bosworth <laughs> is like, what's going on in here? I got, excuse me, I got to get some water for my guns. <laughs> it happens to be right next to Dominguez's <laughs> and office. His nipples, his nipples are showing through that shirt. Like, <laughs> it was cold in there. That's all I'm going to say. This Dominguez. meeting with Dominguez, it just cannot look any worse for Dominguez as far as being a cop. It kind of exonerates him as being dirty, but at the same time, he starts laying out like, well, this also could be connected to six other dead drug dealers who were robbed and murdered. I probably should have told you guys because sometimes you guys pretend to be drug dealers, too. <laughs> that was my bad. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> 
he says that Montana is one of the few people that has access to the files. And everyone is like, okay, what about who else you got? Yeah, he goes, but it couldn't be <laughs> <Yeah>. her. <laughs> could possibly be her. I mean, why would someone that has to hang around with homeless people all day, uh, why would they tur- uh, turn on us? She clearly loves her job. Yeah, I mean, she. the murders are happening on the river. She's the one working undercover at the river, and they seem to have a leak in their department, and everything is happening at the river, and she's one of the people that has the key. Ah, man, I wonder who else it could be, because it definitely can't be Montana. (laughs) Can't be her. (laughs) Hold on one second. Later, at Dominguez's yacht, the dirty cops show up there. One person stands at the door. The rest of them go inside. You hear some screaming, gunshots, and, of course, Dominguez and his wife are now dead. Oh, they didn't say if his wife was dead. I wondered that. They Go said they sleep with the dead. fishes. She, I mean, <laughs> it's she, Brian Bosworth's yacht now. Yeah, I was gonna say like <laughs> she's got to be dead, right? Because then she would just identify them as the murderers. That's what I kept thinking. They never said she was dead, so I was like, she's got to be dead though, because she would just say like, "It's your friend from work." You know? <laughs> 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 the one that shot him. I, I love how the fire squad never goes to that crime scene. <laughs> nah, like, we don't need to go there. He's dead. Also, it seems like they could have solved it easily if they just would have pulled up that little bridge at night. Also, if they had just not had the stupid meeting at his office, you're investigating people in your squad. Like, go somewhere, go have some lunch, go have some Cuban yeah. coffee or something. <laughs> I don't think it's kind of dawned on them yet that they probably shouldn't be relying on the, on the uh, spec ops guys during an investigation over the spec op guys. <laughs> exactly. Because uh, later on, like at the end here, they're, they're going to do a sting. And they're going to get back up from the spec op guys. Who saw a tub <laughs> at the meeting. <laughs> Guns himself. <laughs> Two fast scenes. One, the duo are driving and they're discussing about like what's going on with the murders and their locations. And they're going to investigate where some of the murders have happened. But dad calls and says, turn around, go back out to, to Dominguez's because he's been murdered. He's dead. <laughs> he's very cold about it. Yeah, they seem like- to be very close, too. Yeah, well, they seem like it, but apparently not. (laughs) He's like, he did. Go see what happened to him. (laughs) At the precinct, the duo plus dad are going through the paperwork late at night, and Sonny seems to have found a pattern that, like we were mentioning, the six of the murders, Montana was working on them. She's the one that got the statement, or gave a statement, and she has to be working down by the river. Both dad and Crockett are like... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Both dad and Crockett are saying, like, this is pretty coincidental and Tubbs like no way i'm gonna go down to hoboville and go talk to her about this right now yeah because the day is Tubbs' day to be an idiot <laughs> and so like i'm waving my hands around here because this is i'm i'm, I'm upset at Tubbs. Tubbs, you're my man i love you Tubbs. i i have said continuously you are the second best police officer on that force other than Trudy. <laughs> <laughs> you are a better police officer than Sonny Crockett. You go down to Hoboville, you go talk to Montana, and then you tell her exactly what's happening. <laughs> You're being investigated because it's coincidental that you happen to be <laughs> next to when all these murders happen. Well, Why, luckily, the relationship goes both ways because apparently no one cares about leverage on this show. Also, but is Montana undercover name too? Or are they just openly <laughs> talking about being cops on the uh, uh, <laughs> surrounded by the people she's undercover with? <laughs> She says it can't possibly be her. You know that's a bunch of bull honky. And sorry, it can't possibly be me, but it is me. <laughs> Tubbs says to do list murder Tubbs. <laughs> Tubbs says I think there's something bad in the water and leaves. He just leaves like he goes and tells her that <laughs> we're investigating you because, and I want to know what your whereabouts have been. Oh, and he did, and he did actually tell her that Dominguez was dead because she did not know that. That's a key yeah. part of that conversation. She's like, "Oh, yeah. stop, stop, over in the soup." <laughs> Officer Ricardo Tubbs is Sonny spiking your water with whatever he's got going on on his side of the desk. No, because Sonny has become <laughs> a better cop. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> he had that one weekend he was in charge of everything, and he's like. I'm like Castillo up in here. <laughs> we get this quick scene where she calls and t- tries to tell the gang that she's out. And they basically say, no, you're not out. You can't be out or we'll take you down. And then she's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. And she says, I can't believe you killed Dominguez. He brought you guys in. Mm. Well, continuing the trend of bad police work. She has just been told she's being investigated for this 
perhaps being linked to everything that's happening. She immediately goes and makes a phone call to the criminals that she's involved with and then goes down to the office to try and steal more files. Did you think people were going to be paying attention? Of course people are going to be paying attention. I think that's why she's in the homeless camp because she's not that good. (laughs) Uh, And I'm not even sure if Tubbs ever actually left because she goes from talking to him. He says, you know, the water stinks or whatever, walks away. (laughs) She makes the phone call. And then she goes down to the precinct where Tubbs just pops up like, gotcha, bitch. (laughs) (laughs) I've been following you the whole time. So now they have Montana arrested. They take her down. She's in custody. She gets her mug shot. And then when she goes into jail, the rest of the women in jail are not fond of a police officer being in lockup now. So they're threatening her as she walks down to go talk to Tubbs and her lawyer. Credit to her lawyer. They they sounded very friendly. I thought she was going to have a wonderful time in there. (laughs) Credit to her lawyer, who tries to say, maybe you should keep your mouth shut. But she doesn't listen to him. So this is what I was talking about uh, a few seats. So Tubbs goes and lays out that they're investigating her and all that. He catches her because she's stupid. (laughs) And then in the interview, not only does her and Tubbs both keep telling the lawyer to shut up, she basically gives away everything before she asks for a deal. Just She just starts blabbing. Yeah, I did this and we robbed this. And at first it started out, we were just stealing candy from babies. (laughs) Um, And then we started murdering the babies. (laughs) Then it, you know. But she just gives everything away and at the very end. The the lawyers like try to do a little bit of his job, like try to say he's like we already talked about the case. We're gonna try and do witness protection. And Tubbs is like, she would last a day witness protection. And it's like <laughs> like, wow, you know, I know you guys lose a lot of witnesses. Witness protection is actually supposed to be uh protection. <laughs> yeah, she says that her cut was 20% too. So she was actually getting a fair amount of money and that she's willing to take any deal because she wants, I guess, to do the right thing. Question mark. Is that what she wants to do now? She would take any deal if it was what if it was what her stipulation was when she shows him later on what she shows him. Yeah, because this yeah. this next scene is the most well, confusing. But, but what scene. leverage? Yeah, because what leverage does she have to make them actually go so she could show him something? They have everything. She just broke down the whole case. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. This is what they did. Why. These are the criminals involved. I think why do they need her? I think it was because Tubbs wanted her to help them catch them. So he was going to use her against them. But they him. already, she could testify against them. They know, already have them. She's already admitted to it all. Well, I think that now that you're explaining it, I think they did a very poor job of explaining what it is that you're talking about. Is that if she testified, she would go to jail and do her sentence, but a shortened sentence for the deal. And Tubbs like, she wouldn't last a day in here. But if she helps us bring down She Cologne, won't have to go to jail. Then she won't have to go to jail and she'll be able to keep her cover that she never then ratted them out. Yeah. That she, you know, got, got arrested just like them, and which is what they staged to do. That they staged to have her set up this deal and then it was going to get broken up and then everyone would get arrested and then he wouldn't suspect Montana of being the problem. It would be Tubbs was the one that infiltrated the, the yeah. gang, essentially. And so that's how he's going to help her because she's a cop that she doesn't testify. She goes and then brings him in and then she'll be able to get a more lenient sentence and not be actually in jail. Okay, so they're just going to let her go then, even though she's technically associated associated with multiple murders some some murders of police officers but not maybe not let her go but she just wouldn't go to prison like a slap on the wrist like okay you get like probation or something the valerie hey, fine yeah i mean valerie <laughs> did, she murdered somebody cold-bloodedly and she didn't oh wait that was tubbed with, with her no, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> but let's just talk about how bad of an idea it is for tubs to go undercover after you know they robbed and almost killed him the first time <laughs> Also, or after the they fact saw that, him in the office. <laughs> yes. Saw him in the office. They should know the fact that he's a cop at this point now. I, I don't know. The, you know, that whole meeting with Dominguez just kind of really just gave it away that he's a cop. Yeah. Yeah. And then this next scene is the most confusing scene for me, too, because 
did they just go there to argue? Is that what they did? No, she went there to show him where the money went. She was they, she asked her oh, where her money okay. went. Did you guys like not watch the show at all? <laughs> he no, asked no, her no, where no. the I, I get that's what she spent the money on, but why do we care? I, she was trying to show him that she didn't do it for herself. That what she what she did, she took all that money, she did all that stuff, the corrupt stuff she was doing. Because and it didn't matter to her when she took the money in the beginning because they were doing it to dealers. So she didn't give a crap about dealers because they're bad people. So she took the money and she was going to go and she was going to help these people. So that's why she was showing him. And that was part of why she took them there is because that was why she wanted to keep the money she had left in the trust fund so that they could continue mm-hmm. to run. If, if she, she wasn't going to be a cop anymore, that's fine. If she was going to be charged, that's fine. But the leftover money would continue yeah, to run the, the homeless camp. So she was showing him what she had done. Like, this is what I did put my money in. In what world are they going to let stolen money continue to fund something by a dirty cop? Their little day trip was just to make Tubbs feel better about arresting her. Is that it? I, I guess what I'm asking is, why do they have to actually go there? Because she was trying to make a point. Well, obviously, they went there because my... <laughs> Do you guys not know Look the show? Look at these old homeless people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I do it for them. Clearly, they went there. <laughs> clearly, it's gone over the two of your guys' heads and passed away over you. But the show was just clearly... Don't the criminal the show was, investigator... Well, let me finish. What I'm saying is, the show was clearly trying to make a point about homelessness. Okay? So, how do you do that? You go show a bunch of homeless people living in a camp <laughs> together, and she's like a saint. Also, why would we care about her unless there's a reason for her to be a good person, right? It doesn't drive home the point if she's like at the station and she's like, well, I bought a bunch of homeless people some soup, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I got old Johnny a jacket. <laughs> I'm going to admit that old white lady didn't look very homeless. <laughs> I know, some of them didn't look homeless, but that's not the point. The point is like the show's trying to drive home the fact that there's homeless people and that no one's helping them. And no one cares about them. It'd be like a crusader for them, even though it doesn't make any sense what she was doing. Like, whatever, I get that point. So she but bought them a dock. She bought them food and the clothing and the housing. She bought that land. She's saying, I bought this land. I bought this. I bought that. I bought medicine and everything for them. And so that's what, like, all her money went to that. And she's saying, I didn't keep any of it for myself. Yeah, and she has a trust already set up. Yeah. I well, guess. I guess, you know, the trust will help with evidence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but John is right. Like, it, there's no way that they would let her keep that money. If she went to jail, that that's what she's trying to say, though. That's part of the deal. If I go to, if I'm going to mm-hmm. do this, I want my money to be protected, but that you won't take the money from me. But I don't think that's realistic. I don't think they would ever do that. But that's what she was trying to say. Unless they were never going to say anything. I, Tubbs is going to be like, I'm, I'm not going to tell the DA that where all the stolen money went. Well, yeah, because if she spent it, she spent it. You can't get it back, right? Well, it's in a trust. Yeah, but then... Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, who, so, but if they, they don't know the about the trust, yeah, then yeah, yeah exactly. well, yeah, who's exactly. running the trust? Like, who's actually handling the money? Does the does homeless Kenny Loggins take over <laughs> control of the money? Maybe he spends it all on his hair, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're almost to the end of this episode. They have their plan in place now. That the precinct Tubbs is telling Dad and Crockett, "This is what's going to happen. Montana's going to set me up as a New York buyer." They won't recognize me. Dad agrees, says, okay, let's create a fake file. That way, when she pulls the file, it'll, he'll, his stuff will be in there as Cooper. And then she's going to wear a wire. She also wants a weapon, and everyone's nervous about that. Like, why does she? We can't. Like, I don't yeah. know if we can trust her, but Tubbs like, no, it's cool. Trust me. I need backup, too. Probably not a good idea to give the criminal a gun. Also, no one thinks this is a bad idea at all. Like no, this whole no thing. one steps in. Like, <laughs> Not even Switek. Usually he's the one that's like, are we sure we want to do this? <laughs> now to the final bus where they're going to fi- finally get Cologne. Police advice are watching from a distance. We're like basically back to where we started. Tubbs is going to go undercover and go do this deal. Then the vice and Miami-Dade police are going to come charging in. Montana and Tubbs go in. He's on his Cooper. They take his weapon. But they also are well aware of his street dealings because of the file and stuff, whatever. He's Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> Montana is very nervous and cologne can tell too he's like there's something not right with you so she's not hiding it very well but eventually they say okay let's go to my office and let's go do this deal outside brian bosworth shows up the guy from the precinct who now will absolutely recognize Tubbs as a police officer because of that dominguez meeting at his office that he was so interested in spying on he he desperately needed that cup of water at that time Inside, Cooper is ready to make a buy for a hundred keys. So they're going to bring down Cologne big time in this deal. But Boz comes in and recognizes Tubbs 
asks why is a vice cop there. Everyone pulls their guns. Cologne turns to Montana and says, you got to be dirty then if the vice cop ended up in here. And just then, smash, <laughs> in comes a Miami-Dade truck through the wall. Police, out, police shootout starts. Bunch of people start dying. <laughs> Cologne goes running out the door, stops, turns, fires a perfect shot on Montana. Runs out the door. Sonny, of course, is going to chase Cologne. He's because he's going to kill everyone at the end of every episode in season four. Cologne makes it up on top mm-hmm. of a houseboat. Sonny shoots and kills him. Does it? No one goes to gets the body. Cologne's <laughs> body dead. is still in the water. <laughs> <laughs> no need to check that. <laughs> Comes back in and sees Tubbs was with Montana. Montana dies in his arms, and Tubbs says, well, "Call an ambulance." Sonny's like, no, bro, it's okay. Like, yeah. Sonny, you check the holes. He's like, nah, we're good. Don't bother. Apparently, we don't check to make sure anyone's alive in this episode. He fell in the water. He's clearly dead. Uh, don't, don't go after okay. him. Okay, so this episode, like, as we are coming to a close now, the gunfight's over. We've lost about seven drug dealers. About seven drug dealers died, I think, throughout the episode. And somewhere around 20 or 30 cops, I want to say, get <laughs> shot. Well, at least nine, right? <laughs> At least nine of the, the nine dirty ones. <laughs> yes. I love that the very next scene is kind of just Tubbs and Crockett kind of like bullshitting like, oh, just another case. Only a few dozen cops and drug dealers got murdered. And <laughs> <laughs> like just another Tuesday. The only thing that we see that's co- confirming is that they do keep the trust and that the money is going towards helping homelessness in the city of Miami. With M- Montana's soup kitchen. Mm-hmm. They let Sonny keep his job after he's got a guy off of death row who needed to be on death <laughs> Sonny, row. <laughs> yes, but in the reverse side of that, Sonny also, all of his cars and boats and clothes that he owns are all formerly owned by drug dealers. I would suspect that that piece of land would be Miami Dade's next <laughs> <Yeah>. warehouse <laughs> to be robbed. And that is the end of this episode. I have we've obviously had some hefty back and forth <laughs> and what our opinions are as things have happened inside of this episode. So I have some additional thoughts that I'm going to add to that, but I'll save them for my final thoughts because we actually, believe it or not, have music this week. Not like last week <laughs> where we had none, which I'm still mo- mo- still mind-boggling to me that we didn't have any music. But this week we actually have some. So let's go break down this week's music. All right, John. Not only do we have music, but we have two bands that we've never had before. So it's this is actually a really good way to follow up a week of no music. Yeah, no, we've actually got some new bands we've never talked about before. And we're going to start off with the song Glory Glory by Underworld. Underworld's a British electronic music group formed in 1980. Their principal members are Carl Hyde and Rick Smith, and then pretty much just a rotation of different people. They began their partnership in 1979 with a band called Screen Gems. Along with several members of that of Screen Gems, they would form a new wave band whose name was just a graphic squiggle. So <laughs> and if you if you actually it, that, this band is awesome when it comes to names, and you, you, I'm going to have plenty more fun ones, but that that is pretty cool. You should look up that graphics squiggle, because it's, it's kind of funny. You know, you'll, <laughs> you'll instantly get the reference. So, but they pronounced the squiggle Friar. <laughs> Doesn't sound phallic at all to me. <laughs> they released one album and then they actually disbanded in 86 when their second album get us out of here was uh withheld by the record company and i believe they would eventually get it released but it would prompt them in 87 to form underworld which was named after a clive barker script film the movie they're named after was scored by Friar or mm. Graphic Squiggle. <laughs> <sighs> so, kind of explains why they chose the name. They would release several albums pretty quick. They, they'd release Under the Radar in 88 and 89's Change the Weather. And those would feature their first hit, Doot Doot. <laughs> <laughs> We're winning with names now. <laughs> so, that version would actually come to an end as they would do another lineup change and add, in 1991, DJ Darren Emerson. They actually went out and recruited him. And fans often know this as 
the MK2 version of Underworld. So pretty much they would go from more electronic new wave to kind of being more danceable techno, which I thought was funny that this author made a point to, to talk about, to list the difference as if there was a difference between danceable techno and electronica. Uh, electronica. <laughs> they would stay together as a trio. They would release albums in the 90s. All right, so this first album name is all one word. It is Dub No Bass With My Head Man. Okay. <laughs> all one word. No they need would, for spacing. All one word. Yes, no spacing. So it's pronounced dub my bass with my headband. <laughs> they would also release my favorite album of theirs, Second Toughest in the Infants. <laughs> they got quite the album names. <laughs> yes. Uh, and that's it. They would actually uh, achieve a degree of commercial success with that one, mostly because some of the music would be featured in the movie. Train spotting. The songs Dark and Long and Born Slippy Period X, which, by the way, Born Slippy Nux is their most successful track to date. <laughs> the names. 1999, after releasing their fifth album, Bo Coop Fish. Now they're just making shit up. <laughs> yeah, now they just got out of control. After releasing the album, Hyde would declare in an interview that he had dealt with some of his alcohol is issues. The sessions were fraught with problems as the members of the band were insisted on working in their own studios and just passing raw material back and forth. That album would not do quite as well because of the disparity in the band, although one of the songs would appear on the soundtrack for the movie Vanilla Sky. Around that same time, Emerson would leave the group and the group would continue as just a duo with Hyde and Smith. They would release a uh, album a hundred days off, and then they would do some online only releases, consistently making music, releasing albums, but they also did the soundtrack to the 2006 movie Sunshine. They would also work again with director Danny Boyle to provide songs for Train Spotting 2 soundtrack, as well as Smith would provide the soundtrack for Boyle's movie, 2013 movie, Trance, mm. as well as Danny Boyle's BBC show he was involved with, Babylon. Ah. Smith would do the theme for that. On top of all of that, uh, they would also compose, be asked to compose uh, songs for the 2012 Olympic opening ceremony, in which they would also collaborate with Danny Boyle. Move on to the other song in the episode, Eyes of a Stranger by the Paolas. Paolas are part of, were part of the Vancouver New Wave scene in Canada from the late 70s throughout the 80s. They would also have a reunion in the early 2000s. The name of the band refers to the Paola scandal in the U.S. in the early 60s. The primary members of the band are Paul Hyde and Bob Rock. Now, Paul Hyde, even though this band is from Vancouver, Canada, I cannot rule out him being somehow related to Carl Hyde from the last band, Underworld, being that they're both British and were both born in similar proximity, but no <laughs> articles would confirm. So from one Hyde to the other Hyde, we have Bob... Paul Hyde and Bob Rock, the two had met in high school uh, when they formed the band, and while Bob was working as a record engineer for Little Mountain Sound Studios, they recorded their first single, China Boys, in 1979. That single would get them noticed by a and Records. They would also have to kind of reform as the people they recorded it with all quit the band. Paul and Hyde would put together a new band with A&M Studios, and they would release their debut album, 1980s, Introducing Paolas. They would release a number of albums and see a lot of success in Canada, but they would have a hard time breaking into the U.S. One of the theories is that because their name was the Paola Scandal, because that had a lot to do about radio, that radio stations wouldn't play their music because they didn't want to actually have to talk about or mention <laughs> Scandal. <laughs> so they're doing this the exact same thing to them to avoid talking about the scandal. Yeah, exactly. They also tried different versions of, the, of their name. Uh, in 1985, aside from... 
bringing in David Foster, who was a pop music guru. They would also let Hyde's wife write some songs. And they would also change their name to be known as Paul Hyde and the Payolas, and eventually Rockin' Hyde. (laughs) Uh, But all those changes would fall a little short as they would release the album, Here's the World for Ya, and it would pretty much be a dud. Except for Quincy Jones would commission them for a song for one, for an African Relief Fund project. <clears throat> that song would be Tears Are Not Enough. It would become a number one hit in Canada, as it was co-wrote, co-written with as Iden Rock co-wrote it with Adams, several other, uh, Brian Adams and several other notable artists. But it was clearly, it hit number one because Brian Adams was in, was involved. Exactly. I mean, exactly. Because Brian Adams is a treasure for the world. Everyone loves Brian Adams. And he is the greatest thing that ever happened. And <laughs> not this very <laughs> uncomfortable conversation I had with my wife. <laughs> earlier this week who said that she doesn't like brian adams i didn't say i didn't like what? him i just i <laughs> <laughs> the only people that don't like brian adams right now are you and trump <laughs> well i mean actually i didn't say i didn't that i didn't like him i just said i don't understand what all the hype was sorry he's no rod stewart what do you better. want me to say <laughs> <laughs> i'm no rod stewart that's it i quit <laughs> <laughs> See ya. I'm leaving. He's just digging a deeper hole now. <laughs> He's no sting. I said it. There. I, and I don't take that back. The police aren't very good. You heard it here. Brian Adams is better than yeah, the Yeah, I'm sure you're going to get hate mail because of Brian Adams. <laughs> not because he said the police. Don't you guys just love the music segment? Um, <laughs> uh, if, if we did get hate mail, this is where it would all come. <laughs> The music segment, breaking up marriages all over. <laughs> yes. Yes. Let's see who else we insult. We've already got one guy who's, who who will probably sue us eventually. <laughs> yeah. In 1987, they would rebrand as Rock and Hide. And after being dropped by AM Records, they would release Under the Volcano with EMI. And they would work with Bruce Fairburn, who also produced music for Bon Jovi and Aerosmith. They would finally release this critically acclaimed, well-received album that would have hits in both Canada and the U.S. So it's like they finally did it, guys. They broke into the U.S. (laughs) market. They toured a little bit. And then they would strangely take a hiatus for no apparent reason from 1989 to 2003. (laughs) <laughs> that is uh that they nicknamed the long hiatus. So yeah, they finally broke into the US market and got some songs to chart and then they just stopped making music together. Rock would produce bands, he would focus on producing and produce bands like Motley Crue and Metallica. Yeah. While Hyde would start releasing solo stuff often with either having Rock help form instrumentals or produce. So, but they would not make music together as the Payolas until 2003 when they would release a reunion seven song EP called Langford Part One. Unfortunately, there would never be a Langford Part Two <laughs> as in 2008 the band would stop performing, in 2009 their website would be shut down. <laughs> And in 2009, Hyde would also resume his solo career. But I just love that. They finally got started getting recognition in the U.S. It's like, okay, we did it. Cool. Let's go do other stuff. <laughs> there you go. There is there is the story of the two Hydes, who probably aren't related, but I like to think they are. Well, John, I think we can all say that we're just happy that music has returned to Miami Vice and that we're happy to have a music segment again. And any time it mentions Brian Adams in one way or another is a great music segment. <laughs> yes. Yes. We love Brian Adams, even if not all of us, even if only two thirds of us do. Just like only two so. thirds like Noogie and nobody else. <laughs> Just saying. By the way, on a side note, 
Paul Hyde or Bob Rock, if by any chance you are listening to this, we're still waiting for Lingford Part 2. <laughs> Anytime now, boys. <laughs> well, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. Um, like I said, I still got some I still got some things buried in there that I want to get out, make sure they get out on record. Let's go give our final thoughts on this one. All right, John. What are your final thoughts on this week's episode? My final thoughts are Brian Adams is amazing. <laughs> I love Brian Adams. There's a music video with Brian Adams where he, in the music video, he's got this German shepherd next to him. And it was the ger- the owner of the studio's dog. But he loved Brian Adams so much he wouldn't leave his side <laughs> that they just left him in the video. Like that's, that's cool. how much people love Brian Adams. And that's why so. I don't like dogs in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> that's why cats are better. <laughs> the so cat would pee on his dog. leg. <laughs> Poor Tinky. <laughs> yeah, she's so bad. My dog's like dead right now. She's like upside down. <laughs> I'll be serious. As far as our Dirty Cop episodes go, I think this one ranks on that middle of the road. I, I liked the Tubbs ask, and I felt like if it was less confusing throughout the episode, it might have ranked higher. But, I mean, there's clearly there are some Dirty Cop episodes that are just going to be above it. You know, like the one where Crockett's got the money on the boat and with the pirates. And, <laughs> like, we, we've had so many Dirty Cop episodes, I feel like we would have a... a you could make a top 20 list. And so I think this one would fall somewhere in like around eight. I want to say, I think it was good for season four. I will say that. <laughs> I like how that's our qualifier for everything. For season four, it was good. <laughs> I, I I definitely enjoyed it more than Crockett's pop star girlfriend or uh, uh, wife, sorry, wife, you know, or some of the other things we've, we've gone through this, uh, this season, I was very happy to have music back. Um, so, but it just, it kept bugging me the whole time watching it. Like, how do they not know Tubbs is a cop? Like, why would she break into and get the files if it didn't actually say, like, hey, this is Tubbs' case? And like, from the very beginning, like, they should have known he was a cop. You know, and I think we've pretty much thrown out every different scenario to try and figure out how this all this works together. And I think no matter how we spin it, there's always a fatal flaw plot wise somewhere. So but I mean, if you throw the plot out the window, it's an enjoyable episode. (laughs) Melissa, what are your final thoughts? It's the world's okayest episode. (laughs) 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 No, it's it's so middle of the road for me. Like, I love the fact that it's a complete story. You get to see at the end, like, what happened. She died. Okay, usually that was where it would end. You'd be like, okay, great. What happened to the homeless people? Did they ever get their soup? I mean, I need to know these things. <laughs> now you know, like, whatever. And for whatever reason, she did, her her mission did get completed. That they, I, they actually continued her work, which is good. And you get the completion of it. It was very confusing. I will say that a lot of it was very confusing. And I felt like they wanted you to overlook a lot of plot holes. Yes, we should have. They should have known that Tubbs was a cop. The Vice Squad should have known that sending that sending Tubbs in there was a terrible idea. <laughs> they should have known Montana was involved in it from the beginning. Lots of big things that didn't make any sense at all. Also, I didn't think they were being very secretive about the fact that they were going to be cops. That they were going to find these cops and they were going to be like there was no other option. Like there, there was real no. Exp- they they put it out there like, well, are they cops or aren't they? And then like five minutes in, like, yeah, they're cops. We get it. Okay, <laughs> we understand. They're cops. <laughs> so I mean, I liked it. It was okay. It wasn't terrible. It was okay. Like I guess we're just going along with the theme of it was good for season four. But if you put it in a season one or two, it would be terrible. <laughs> 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 I totally agree with you guys. It's it's an okay episode. Middle of the road. It does, you know, it, it's okay. I enjoyed it. It was not super big twists and there wasn't anything that caught me off guard. It was it was an episode of Miami Vice and it was very cookie cutter and how it followed. We've as you guys have mentioned, like we've had lots of dirty cop episodes. There was nothing new here. Oh in, in it's a very familiar place to be that the dirty cop was doing the things for the right reasons, doing the wrong things for the right reasons. And they just get mixed up in a bad situation that spirals out of control. So that's a very familiar place for us to be in for Miami Vice. And I think we belabored it plenty, which is the problem that comes down to is the money. How does the money continue to stay 
in Montana's trust and not be taken out by the police or by the justice system. And I think when we get to the end of this episode, we are to believe that Sonny and Rico said nothing about where the money really was. And that we're supposed to believe that maybe Tubbs helped it happen. That turns into Montana's soup kitchen. And they're able to continue to help the homeless people, which is a great cause. But I think that that's what they're trying to get to is that Rico and Sonny helped with the lie to yeah. make sure that Montana's vision came true for that she was helping the homeless people, which is a huge problem following last week. <laughs> last week, when they were supposed to keep Trudy's quote unquote personal feelings yeah. out of the case. Exactly. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> there is even an episode gap. <laughs> every next episode it's like we just did this because we wanted to we thought it was right <laughs> well we're by the book you, you know what that that might explain why there's very little truth if any truth at all in this episode yeah. like she's just so pissed sitting in the break room just steaming <laughs> fucking ass <laughs> And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com, Facebook.com slash GoWithTheHeat, Twitter.com slash GoWithTheHeat, Instagram at GoWithTheHeat. You can find us in any of those locations. We would love to hear from you. You want to get us on Anchor on the Anchor.fm app? We're on there. You want to get us on your tubes? You just yell, go up to your neighbor's window, yell <laughs> into it. Hey, fill in the Echo, the Amazon Assistant, or the Google Home. Play the latest Miami Vice podcast and just share the wealth. Just <laughs> yell into people's windows as you walk down the street. Just yell to their phones. Say, hey, Siri, and then let them know which podcast they should be <laughs> listening to. Just yell it out everywhere you go. <laughs> be sure to check out that website, go with heat.com. You can find all the other ways that you can subscribe to the show and all the other ways that you can find us. Like I mentioned, we would love to hear from you. And you can also show your support. You can go to that website, click, click, click on support and find out how you can support us. Support number one, send us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Support number two, go to your podcast, your platform of choice and leave us a review. Just give us the highest ranking. That's all that anyone cares about. Just give us the five stars, but do not write a review. No one ever reads the review. So instead, in the review instead, section. Instead, tell us how much you love Brian Adams. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it an ode to Brian Adams as, as deep cut in the summer of 69, how much you loved Brian Adams. Because apparently he's going to teach you all about how the ways that you need to love a woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pal.